morning, and welcome to Faith Way Baptist Church. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to start off with a song called Before Our God. It's not going to be in your hymnals this morning. Uh, it's one we've sung for several years now. It may be unfamiliar to a few of you, uh, but when uh, you listen through that first verse, feel free to join us on the second if you don't know it. So let's go ahead and start with Behold Our God. We'll have the words up there on the screen. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore. In our next hymn this morning, hymn 381, if you want to get the words there in your hymnal, they'll also be on the screen. Blessed assurance, we can have that assurance through Christ. We'll sing all three verses. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. Of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with 
with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. song this morning almost all the way to the back of the hymnal there hymn 683 683 jesus draw me ever near that ought to be our natural response to having that assurance in christ for us to get even closer to him we'll sing all three verses jesus draw me those words on the screen for a moment, Caroline, if you don't mind. If you notice the last verse of that song, it's actually a, a blessing. It's a prayer that the early church would pray. And you notice at the very end, the last phrase, with your likeness, let me wake. You realize the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, that man, male and female, God created us in his image, in the likeness of God. And then sin messed us everything up, didn't it? It ruined everything. But the Bible tells us, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, one day, at the end of your heart's testing, at the end of your journey, you're going to wake and you're going to find yourself created once again in the image of God, in perfectness. And that's the blessing that we have to look forward to as Christians. We're on a journey, we're heading towards the promised land, where there will be no more sin, no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. And what a journey this is. I'm so thankful that we have an end in sight, aren't you? Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you that your hand is not slack, that it cannot save. We thank you, Lord, that in spite of our sin, in spite of who we are, you reached down and you saved us. You sent your son to die on the cross for our sin. I pray today, Lord, that we would revel in that and we would joy in what we have in you. And that in the midst of this long passage, this long journey, whatever trial we are facing today, whatever difficulty we are going through, may we remember at the end... We will see you as you are, and we will be made once again in your perfect image where sin does not corrupt, 
We long for that day, and Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength today to continue pressing on for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. It's good to have you this morning here at Faithway. And I don't know if you ever really put any serious thought into why we gather together for corporate worship, but really, the journey that you and I are on, it's very difficult to do it all by yourself. In fact, the Bible tells us the early church gathered together on the first day of the week to encourage each other in the things of the Lord. And we're here today to stir each other up, to encourage you. And we're going to read the Bible together. We're going to sing together. And uh, the whole point of our gathering together is to worship Jesus Christ, but also to give you spiritual food and ammunition that you need as you walk out into a world that is so far from God. Um, you know, we have coming up here, and I think it's next week, an election uh, here in Virginia, a primary election. And uh, we have been oftentimes, uh, you know, bemoaning the fact that there are people in office that don't follow biblical values. This is an opportunity, Christians, for you to get out and for you to vote. We'll never tell you how to vote here, but I'll tell you what you should vote is the Bible. So you find a candidate that lines up with biblical values as a Christian the best that you can, and uh, you vote for that person, and uh, may, may God give us mercy here in our country. And so please take advantage of that. I know it's a little bit of a different primary this year, um, and so you're going to have to do a little bit of work to get to the polls most likely. But if you can do that, I know it would be uh, certainly something God tells us if we have a voice for government, we should do our best to, to make our voice and influence known. Speaking along those lines, we believe firmly at our church that God created male and female, created he them. Not only that, but the Bible tells us that um, from conception, life is important. And we uh, are trying to practice what we preach. And there is a crisis pregnancy center in Fairfax around the Mother's Day holiday especially. They ask churches to help bring diapers and ointment and wipes and all of those things. are actually now formula would be an amazing thing if you're able to find that. Um, we're going to keep the donations open for one more week. And so if you would like to bring some diapers to help this local crisis pregnancy center, um, that would be awesome. Uh, if you noticed on the way in this morning, one of the tables out there in the lobby, it's filled with diapers that y'all have brought. Thank you for that. And Jill Baker works with them. And so she's going to be taking uh, those donations next Sunday or Monday to them to, so that way they can have them for the ladies that choose life. And uh, they pr promise there at that center that if you choose life, that they will do the best they can to supply diapers and things that moms need uh, throughout the journey there in the early years. And so we're going to do the best we can as a church to help out in that avenue. Another ministry that we have here that some of you may or may not be aware of is a uh, ministry we work with. It's called, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, a foster care ministry. Phil, can I get your microphone for a second? We have every, um, every month there are some people in our church that give money towards a foster care uh, program that we have here at Faithway. And essentially what we do with that is we provide um, gift cards or encouragement, uh, financial encouragement to people who are in the midst of fostering children. And if you've ever considered fostering, that's an amazing blessing and gift from God to be able to do that. I don't know that we have any foster parents in our church presently, but I know some of you have done that before in the past, and you know the blessing and especially the heartache that can come from that, but it is certainly a needed thing. And there is a couple of different churches in the area that all kind of get together in the foster care ministry, and we pool our resources to help and be a blessing to the families that are in the midst of that. And over Christmas, we put together a, I think it was six or seven J baskets, gift baskets that were filled with toys and backpacks and gift cards and several hundred dollars in each basket that we gave to these families that were sponsoring foster kids. And uh, we heard back from one family with a card, one of the baskets, and ironically, this past week, um, my cell phone rang, I didn't have a chance to answer it, and when I listened to the voicemail, it was from a lady, uh, her family received one of the baskets from our church. And so I'd like to play this voicemail to you, just so I know many of you gave towards that foster care program, just so you can hear that and you can uh, just uh, appreciate the blessing. When I got this voicemail, I was really encouraged by it, and I think you will be as well. Hello, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to call. I wanted to say that we were one of the foster families that received some of the gifts and things uh, over the holidays. And I just wanted to let you all know that everything was very much appreciate, appreciated. And um, your thoughtful uh, note inside the card was a delight. Uh, thank you for thinking of foster families. Um, we really appreciated it. Thank you so much. 
And so that's just one of the families that we were able to help out over Christmas. And so I just want to let you know, as you consider giving towards the different needs of the church ministry, we as a church are doing the best we can to reach our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We always include in our gift baskets uh, invitations to the church, but also gospel uh, outreach materials and just explain the simple truth of Jesus Christ to them. And uh, this past week, Jay, we were able to put together, I think, was it four more packages, four more? Seven, okay, seven more gift packages with the finances that you've given. And uh, so we're thankful for your faithfulness and giving towards the ministry here of our church. Um, Just want to give you a couple of quick announcements. First of all, we had a weekly update that went out that said we were having a Faithway family meal this month. We're not going to be having one, but the last Sunday of June, June 26th, we are going to be having a missionary family with us. Matt Shields and his wife are missionaries to Aruba, and uh, they have quite a ministry there. Jay actually is a pilot in our church, and he's been there and actually visited them in their ministry. And uh, so it's quite, a, quite an opportunity that we have to have their family with us. And we're going to be having a Faithway family meal with the Shields on June 26th. And so if you can be here for that, we'll have some more information coming out about that here in the near future. Also, I want to remind you that we as a church support many missionaries around the world. I think we have 13, 14 different missionary families. And today, instead of a specific missionary update, I'd like to at least have these names up here on the screen for you to kind of pray through um, as a church family today. What I'd like to do is a little bit different. Um, Jeremy and Amanda Tyler are serving the Lord in Brazil. Paul and Loretta Hitz are in Baffin Island, Canada. Paul and Sarah Johnson are serving the Lord in Japan. The Sislers actually have come off the field now. They transition, but they're in Uruguay, and they are now um, the church there in Uruguay. We can pray for them as they hand it off to a national pastor. Nathan and Sarah Ring are in Brazil. The DeWalds uh, are in um, Dominican Republic. Tatiana is in Brazil working with the Rings, and she's kind of helping in the children's ministry there. Russ and Beth Holland are serving the Lord in Norway. The Vallis family are in Turks and Caicos. The Campbells are in Wales, in the UK. And the Stowes, Brett was with us on Wednesday night a couple of weeks back. The Stowes are in South Africa. And the Ewings are in Indonesia. And uh, Becca Joseph is serving the Lord in Honduras. And she's raising funds and hopefully will be there by the end of this year. And uh, so those are the missionary families that we currently support around the world. And what I'd like us to do this morning, instead of praying for one missionary family is for you to pick a missionary uh, that you'd like to pray for. And then I'd like us to just take a moment uh, as a a church family, and maybe you pray by yourself or grab someone sitting near you this morning, but pick one of those families, and let's just spend a minute or two in prayer for one of those missionary families that the Lord puts on your heart. And then I'll get up and I'll close our time in prayer together. So let's pray this morning. Uh, You pick and pray with someone near you, pray by yourself, whatever you want to do, and then I'll get up and close in a moment in prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity we have to um, not only pray for our missionaries, but to support them financially. I know that the money that we give is really a lifeline for them as they are on the field and they cannot raid or they can't work uh, because of a lot of times the religious visas that they have, and they're doing the best they can to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ in uh, regions of the world that we cannot go to. Lord, I pray this morning corporately for all of our missionaries for their safety that you'd watch over them and protect them. And as many of them are meeting, even at this moment, uh, with their church families, Lord, I pray that that their churches would grow. There would be fruit that would abound to their accounts. And Lord, I pray that you would just use them in a mighty way in the the near future and that we would see fruit for our giving as well. We love you, Lord. Thank you for their faithful service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, Joseph is going to play a song for us, All Creatures of Our God and King.
pictures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. that. Children through the age of fourth grade, you're dismissed. Kids at this time for Children's Church out the back door. Have a good time learning about God out there. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you could turn to the book of Deuteronomy, please. Deuteronomy. We have been going through the book of Luke, and we have one more week in this book together, the book of Luke. And then when we're done that, we're actually going to go to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that's found in the book of Isaiah. And I have not preached through the book of Isaiah before. It's going to be a journey for all of us. Isaiah is one of those prophets. They're called the major prophets because of the amount of volume that is there. It's right kind of in the middle of your Bible. Um, and it's an amazing book because it talks so much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to go through it. And our, our focus is going to be on the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. And so we're going to take some time going through it. I'm not exactly sure how long it will be. We're going to do an expository study of it, but not, not verse by verse every single chapter. And you'll see why when we get into that book. But it's a great study together. So that's two weeks from today. Uh, Memorial Day weekend is when we're going to start that. But today, I'd like to kind of do a little bit of a topical sermon, which is really out of my wheelhouse, my comfort zone. Um, I normally enjoy going verse by verse through a passage of Scripture. But seeing how last Sunday was Mother's Day... And in a couple of weeks, it's going to be Father's Day. I thought I would kind of just take those two holidays and put them together and talk about the subject this morning of teaching Jesus to your children. Now, I know that I have not arrived yet on this subject. I still have a couple of kids in my house, and there's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long process. Some of you are, ki- are grandparents now. You've, you've gone through the kid phase. Some of you are thinking about having children one day. Some of you have toddlers at home or teenagers. It really doesn't matter. At what age they are, our, our job as parents is to teach our children the Word of God. I heard someone one time say that you know you're a parent when you stop the tears by taping broken crayons back together. You know you're a parent when there's nothing more than you, that you long for than a good night's sleep. You know you're a parent when you know the best way to scrape dried Cheerios off the floor. You know you're a parent when you never have to buy another Christmas ornament. You know you're a parent, and I can testify to this, when you step on Legos in the middle of the night. You know you're a parent, especially the parent of a boy, when, Mom, you find action figures in your washing machine. 
All right, there, there are, you know you're a parent if you've experienced some of those things in your life. If you, don't go, if you don't struggle with those on a regular basis, then you're probably not a parent, all right? But for those of you with children this morning, I want you to tune in because I'm just gonna give you some practical things that God has taught me that I have learned from my parents. I'm thankful for the godly heritage that God has given me. Um, but I guess I have a couple of concerns about this sermon this morning. Number one, for those of you without children, you'll probably wanna tune me out for the next 20 minutes. But I know the truth of the matter is that most of you here in this room, um, you play the, a role in lives of children, whether you're a dad or a mom, a grandma, grandpa or not. There are children in your life that you come in contact with on a regular basis. Maybe you're an uncle, an aunt, uh, maybe you're a school teacher, whatever it might be, but you run, run across children on a regular basis. And so hopefully you love children. If you don't like children, well, let me at least quote Martin Luther, one of the church fathers. Notice what Martin Luther says. People who do not like children are swine, dunces, and blockheads. I'm not calling you that. That's what Martin Luther said, okay? So not worthy to be called men and women because they despise the blessing of God, the creator and author of marriage. So that's Martin Luther. I'm not going to say that, but that's what he said. So hopefully you like children. If you don't like kids, let me at least remind you that Jesus loved children. He loved kids to the point where he said, suffer the children, allow them to come to me. And he received them. He took time for them. And so I'm scared because some of you who don't have kids might tune out this message. But secondly, I'm also a little bit intimidated about preaching a message like this because I realize that I don't have all of the answers. Someone one time said that before I was uh, married and before I had children, I had three theories about raising kids. He said, now I have three children and no theories. So that's kind of how it goes, right? You say, okay, read this book, this book, there's some ideas here, there. But the best book that you can read on raising children is actually found in the Bible. It's the book hopefully you have in front of you this morning. And so I'd like to take you to the Bible, and I'd like to show you what God says, uh, the Word of God, the instructions He's given to us as parents. First thing I want you to see, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is our text. I don't know if I gave you the chapter there. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Number 1, Dad and Mom, Grandma and Grandpa, Aunt and Uncle, those of you who influence children at all, you need the Word of God. All right, the Bible is up there on the screen for you if you need it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Now notice verse number six. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And there's a, there's a colon there, so it, verse seven is going to further define it. Why do these words need to be in your heart? And thou shalt teach them diligently, so teach the words of God diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, Faithway family, there are a lot of good books that you can read on parenting. In fact, my wife and I, there's a, a DVD series that we've taught here at our church um, by Paul Tripp, and that's something that we've gone back and we've watched over and over again. And he has different segments based upon different ages of your children. And so, you know, you deal with a toddler differently than you deal with teenagers. And so we've gone back and we've rewatched some of those videos and trying to get pointers. And there's a, different books that I've read through the course of my life on parenting. But the most important thing that you can be reading for the sake of your children in verse number six, and these words, the Bible, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. The most important thing, dad and mom, that you can do for your children is to read God's word. But more than just reading it, it needs to get into your heart. Your children need to see you having a daily time with God in His Word. They need to see a mom and dad who not only reads their Bible, but they need to see you living it out as well. All right, so number one, verse number six, you need God's Word in your heart, dad and mom. Secondly, though, we are commanded by God to teach our children God's Word. Verse number seven, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children when? Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, for some of us, this can sound intimidating because you say, well, I, I don't have an MDiv, a master's in theology, right? I'm not a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor to read the Bible to your grandchildren, to your children. You don't. In fact, if you're saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't know where to start. Get a, if you have little kids, get a children's story Bible. There's some amazing ones out there. And start by reading uh, stories of God's Word. Start in the Gospels. Our family right now is going through the book of Luke as a family. And we're, we're going through it verse by verse and just reading, you know, five, maybe 15 or 20 verses when we gather together after dinner. Try doing that tonight before you go to bed. R.A. Torrey put it this way. He said, 
Ari Torrey was a pastor of yesteryear, a famous uh, theologian and pastor. He says, it's easiest to lead a child from five to ten years to a definite acceptance of Christ. I, I rejoice in the work done by rescue missions. That that's going to be like places in uh, big cities where they have, you know, drunks and alcoholics and druggies. They go and they get right with God. That's a rescue mission. Where we see the wrecks of manhood and womanhood have changed into noble and, and, and noble men and women. But this is not the work that produces most satisfactory Christians. The younger we get a child to accept Christ and begin Christian training, the more beautiful the product. The overwhelming majority in our churches today were converted before 21 years of age. Whatever your church does, he says, let it do it to its full duty by the children. All right, so, so number two this morning, teach your children God's word. You realize that's your responsibility. Whether they're your kids in your house or not. Maybe your grandma and grandpa and you only have them for the weekend or for a little bit of time. Maybe you influence them some way, somehow. But teach your children the word of God. That's your responsibility. God tells us to do that. Number three, I want you to see Proverbs chapter 22, verse number six. The Bible says this. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So lesson number three here is that you and I need to teach our children the way that they should go. And what I mean by that is you, that in the Hebrew there, train up a child in the way he should go. There have been many parents that have done their best to raise their children to serve God. And at the end, when they're 18 years old or after college, their child, for whatever reason, decides, I'm not going to live for God. I'm going to go off and I'm going to go into the world. And there have been many parents that I have talked to. I've sat down over a cup of coffee with a broken heart. They're crying because their child has departed from the faith that they raised them in. And you look at Proverbs 22, 6, and it seems to say there, if I train my child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. In the Hebrew, what that word, what that verse, maybe a little bit better said means this. Some, train up a child according to his way. Now, the heartbreaking truth is there will be children that will wander from the Lord. But the idea here in Proverbs 22, verse number 6, is that parents ought to be studying, can I say, the way of their children. The way that their children operate, the way that they think. You know, I have two kids, and both of my children obviously are different genders, but they think differently, they act differently. One of them loves hunting. The other one could, just, could care less about that, right? I mean, they're, they're so different, night and day difference. And we ought to be looking, Proverbs 22, 6, for the strengths that our children have and finding the differences between them and teaching our children how to make the most of their strengths. So, so as a parent, as a grandparent, your job is to see your children's innate skills, find out where their talents lie, and then gently... I've learned this, right? Don't expect too much too soon. Lead your children in those areas. Now, it may be difficult for a dad who's an athlete to help and understand a son that would rather play chess than football. But really, if that's where your son thrives, chess is what he needs in order to gain confidence and for him to grow. If he does chess well, that one thing well, then he can come to believe that he can do other things well and he won't be afraid to attempt them. You know, you know that some kids are athletic, some kids aren't. Some kids are musical, some aren't. Some are introverts, some are extroverts. They're all different, but they are all gifts from the Lord. As the psalmist put it in Psalm 127, verse number 3, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. The word heritage there means a blessing. And so children are a gift from the Lord. And so if you look at your child, not just the best athlete in the family, not just the most handsome person, the most beautiful, but all of your children are gifts from God. And if you are to follow the teaching of Proverbs 22, 6, to train up your child in the way that they should go, it takes time to understand your children. It means that we are paying attention to our kids. It's not about squeezing my kids into the same mold it's learning what brings the strengths to the surface and, and kind of minimizing their weaknesses. All right, number three is study your children. Can I give you a fourth principle that I find in the Word of God? Children have a built-in desire to please their parents. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. What, what, the, what, what uh, Solomon is saying here is there is a sense in which children have this built-in desire to want to please mom and dad. Now, now, I know sometimes you say it's hiding pretty deep. I, I don't know where it's at. 
but it's there, believe me. Uh, at least in my, my case, I love my parents, right? And I know that I have got a blessing from the Lord of being raised in a Christian family. Some of you don't know what that is like. And the heartache and the misery that God saved me from by not having to go through some of the things that you went through. I am eternally thankful to God for that. But deep down inside, I love my dad and my mom, and I want to honor them. If my dad called me up today and he said, you know, son, what you're about to do, you're going to make a huge mistake in your life. Now, do I have to obey my dad as a 39-year-old? No, I don't have to. But I want to honor him. And if he told me that I'm heading down the wrong direction, I would weigh his words very carefully before I went proceeded in that direction. Why? Because I love him. And I want to honor him and my mom. And I want to make sure that I do the best that I can to please them in my life. Deep down inside, we all want to please our parents. Some years ago, Columbia University had a great football coach by the name of Lou Little. And uh, one day, Coach Little had a boy try out for the varsity team. This guy wasn't very good. But Lou noticed something very unique about this guy. Um, while he wasn't good enough to make the starting team, he had an impressionable spirit. And he had this contagious enthusiasm about him. And, and so the coach said, you know, he'll probably never be able to play, but I'm going to have him on the team to encourage the others. And so as the season went by, Lou began to develop a tremendous admiration and love for this boy. One of the things that really impressed the coach about him was the manner in which the boy obviously cared for his father. Frequently on the weekends, this boy's father would come to visit for the football games, and he would be there. And uh, on Sundays, they would go to the chapel there located on campus. And they would be seen walking together, arm in arm, an obvious indication of this exceptional bond and love between them. And it was obvious that they not only had this appreciation and love for each other, but they loved their Lord. And there was this Christian faith that they shared together. Well, one day, a phone call came to Coach Little. He was informed by the college staff that this boy's uh, father had passed away in his sleep. And they asked him, since you're such a mentor and you're his coach, would you be the one to break the news to this man? And so with a heavy heart, Coach Lou informed the boy of his father's death. And immediately, um, this boy left to go home for the funeral. Well, a few days later, this boy returned to campus, and it was only two days before the biggest game of the season. Coach went to him and said, I just want to let you know we've been thinking about you here at the team. Is there anything that we can do for you, anything at all? And to the coach's astonishment, the boy said, let me start the game on Saturday, coach. That, that would be awesome if I could do that. And the coach was taken aback a little bit. The big game of the year, you know, we, I can't let you do that. But then he remembered his promise. Is there anything I can do for you, anything at all? And so he said, okay, you know, what's it going to hurt? We'll put him in for the first couple of plays, the first, you know, first round there, first downs, and then we'll take him out afterwards. But to everybody's surprise, when the coach started that boy that day and he began to play, on the very first play from the scrimmage, the boy, that boy single-handedly made a tackle that threw the opposing team for a loss. The boy was so inspired that day as he played, the entire game, the coach kept him in to the point that at the end of the game, he was voted the most outstanding player of the game by his teammates. When the game was finally over and they went into the locker room, Coach Lou approached the boy and he said, son, what got into you today as you were out there on the field? The boy replied, he said, do you remember when my father would visit me here at school? We would spend a lot of time walking together arm in arm around the campus. He said, well, my father and I shared a secret that nobody knew anything about. He said, you see, my father was blind. And for the first time today, he saw me play. Think about that for a moment. This boy wanted to please his dad. And he played that game inspired because he knew for the first time in heaven his dad could see him play. It's important that we take time to invest our lives in our children. It's important that we take time to tell our children that we love them. You know, the experts tell us, and I'm not an expert here, but they tell us that a person's last thoughts on the, of the day remain in the subconscious all night. That's why, Dad and Mom, it's a good thing, before you say goodnight to your child, to praise them for something that they did that day. Maybe there was an act or a word of theirs that made you proud. Something that you saw them do that day, praise them before they go to sleep that night. Why? Because parents are what a child takes pride in. Parents become the examples kids are most likely to follow. Which leads me to thought number five here this morning. Teach by example. Now this is where really all of us fall into play. Maybe you don't have kids living at home. Maybe 
that time is past and you're never going to be able to have children. That's fine, okay. But all of us, as we run into children in our lives, we can lead by example. Billy Graham said this, Children will invariably talk, eat, walk, think, respond, and act like their parents. He said, so give them a target to shoot at. Give them a goal to work towards. Dad and Mom, give them a pattern that they can see clearly. And if you do that, you will give them something that gold and silver cannot buy. In the Old Testament, the kings of Israel were known by whether or not they walked and followed the example of their fathers. In 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse number 3, the Bible says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the ways of his father David, and sought not after Balaam, or Baal, the idols. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 32, it says about this king, that he walked in the way of Asa his father, and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. 2 Chronicles 26, 4, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. 2 Chronicles 27, 2, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah did, Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. That, that was all that his father Uzziah did. So you see there, it doesn't necessarily matter what he was told by his father, but it was all that his father did. It was the example that this king saw in his dad, and he copied his dad's example. I, I think there is a sense in which the kind of father or parent that we are will play a role in how our children relate, relate to God. If you're there involved in your child's life, there is a direct correlation to how your children, I believe, relate to God. A Sunday school class of first graders was asked to draw pictures of God. The pastor stopped by to inspect their artwork and the children are happy to show them their drawings. One had depicted God in the form of a brightly colored rainbow. Another had drawn the face of an old man coming out of billowing clouds. There was one rendition that looked a lot like Superman, but perhaps the best one was proudly displayed by a girl who said, I don't know what God looks like, so I just drew a picture of my daddy. Dads, are you making an impact on your children that will show them God? I hope that our kids see enough of Jesus in us that when they think of God, ideas of God, when they start to formulate their theology of who God is, they will think about their dad. Dad is a hard worker. Dad provides for us. Dad takes care of us. Dad is faithful. And they would think about their dad, and they would say, that's who, an idea of who God is. Right? Is it a perfect example? No. <laughs> I've counseled over the past 15 years of our ministry. There have been times that I've counseled some women who have been abused by their fathers. And as a result... I've seen it that many, many women struggle with overcoming and uh, coming to God because the relationship they had with their dad was incorrect. It wasn't right. Dads, do your children get the concept from you that God is a God of love or that God is angry all the time? Do they see that, that, that God is too busy for them or that God has time for them from you? Mom? You guys can be examples too. I, I love 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15. The Bible tells us that Timothy, um, he, he was influenced by his mother and by his grandmother Lois. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, the not fake faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. Heard the story of some pastors that were sitting around a breakfast table just talking about the ministry and talking about their life. And as often happens when pastors gather together, they bring up theological issues, and uh, they start talking about different things. Well, the discussion today was about the different versions of the Bible. Well, there was a pastor there that liked the good old King James Version, and he said, I like it because of the old English and because it comes from the Texas Receptus Greek, and that's the reason I like this. Another liked the ESV, the English Standard Version, because they said, well, it's the most literal translation that's out there. Another said, well, I really like the a more contemporary version because it's up-to-date vocabulary. It's easy to understand. The fourth pastor was silent for a moment. He said, you know, guys, I like my mother's translation the best. The other pastors were like, I didn't know your mom was a Greek and a Hebrew scholar. He said, no, she wasn't. You see, my mom, while she didn't translate the Bible, she translated it into her life. And it was the most convicting translation that I ever saw. Are you this morning 
living out the word of God in the lives of your children. Maybe you're here today and you're kind of discouraged because your children or your teenagers aren't interested in the things of the Lord. Can I encourage you, dad and mom, grandma and grandpa, you see someone that are walking away from God, keep praying for them, keep loving them, keep living a consistent life before them, never underestimate the power of your example. Grandparents can be great examples too. That's what 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15. Grandma Lois was instrumental in Timothy coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Number five this morning, I'm sorry, number six this morning, we'll close with this. Examples take time. Examples take time. Go back to, or sorry, Deuteronomy chapter six and verse number seven. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That word diligently means over and over and over and over again. I wish I could say to my kids, memorize this verse, and they got it memorized, and they will never struggle for the rest of their life. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works with me, right? I know in my life that God has to continually time in and over and over again, beat me over ahead with a baseball bat, figuratively speaking, right? Because my, thought, my skull is so thick, I can't get it through my head sometimes. And that's the way it is with us as parents, diligently teaching our children. Are you willing to invest the time that it takes in raising children to serve God? Being a good example is hard, dad and mom, when you're not around much. You know, sometimes we get so sidetracked by our careers, and we use it under the guise of, well, I want to be a good provider for my family. The very best thing that you can provide for your ch children is a good example. And it's hard to be a good example when you are not, see what the text says, sittest in thine house. When you are not in thine house because you're so busy with everything else, if you're not by the way with your children, you can't be a good example for them. A pastor one time was so concerned when two of his three sons began to stutter. So he made an appointment with a speech therapist who happened to be a psychologist as well. And after the boys had this conference, this, this appointment, the dad, the pastor, went in and sat down with this, uh, with this psychologist. And the pastor later said, the psychologist blamed me for the boys' problems. He said, he told me I was responsible for their speech defects, that I was the one that was ruining my boys' life. He said, when did, was the last time you took your family on a vacation? The pastor said, well, it's been a long, long time. I was too busy to take time with my family. I remember what I used to say. I used to say, the devil never takes a vacation, so why should I? I never stopped to think that the devil shouldn't be my example to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, are you spending time with your family? Very important. I understand Loudoun County is expensive to live in. I get it. You have to work sometimes overtime in order to meet ends and meets. I understand. It's not necessarily the quantity of time, it's the quality of time. My dad growing up, personal illustration, my dad was an entrepreneur and he would be out the house, out the door by five o'clock every morning at the office by 5.30 and he would work the last person to leave the office, sometimes wouldn't get home till 6.30 or seven. Dinner would be ready as soon as dad came home, we'd all sit down. But as soon as dad came through the door, the cell phone, back then it was the car phone, right? So you didn't have the cell phone, but the phones, that he never answered it, never took a business call, he never opened up the laptop. It was family time until we went to bed. We would eat dinner together, we would read the Bible together, we would wrestle, we would play football together on the living room floor. We would do so many things together as a family. And those memories are seared into my conscience. It's not about how much time, but it's the time that God does allow you to have. Are you investing it in your children? Someone one time, sometime, some time ago wrote, a hundred years from now, it will not matter what kind of car I drove, what kind of house I lived in, how much money I had in my bank account, nor what my clothes looked like, but that the world may be a little better because I was important in the life of a child. What children has God given to you to make an impact on? Now, as a dad and mom, I realize I only have a few more years, really, to invest my time, effort, and energy into my children, and then they're going to be gone. Maybe one day start their own family. I hope they will. Guys, I want to have grandkids one day, okay? But I, I hope that you and I will take the time and invest in our children so that way one day they will teach their children the good news of the Bible 
and they will continue on the faith of their fathers, the faith of their mothers. Who has God given to you to invest in? Hybrid sermon between Mother's Day and Father's Day, challenge to all of us here today, grandparents, fathers, mothers, those of you who don't have kids. Invest your lives in your children and in eternity. You will not regret it. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much that your word gives us all the answers we need in this life. And I know that there are times that we look at the Bible and we look at our kids and we say, oh, I don't know what to do. The Bible is so big, it's so thick. But Lord, there are principles in here that if we will take time to search them out and apply them to our homes and to our lives, you promise us, Lord, that your word will not return void. And I pray that we would do our best to not only be in the word ourselves, but to teach our children the word, to live out an example before them of what God should be, and that we would take the time to influence their theology of who God is. And that, Lord, we would continue to be an example with our time, our effort, our energy that we put into with our children. So that way, one day, Lord, they will rise up and they will call their mother blessed because of the time and the investment we made in them. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to the word of God. And Ellen's going to play just a, a, a short hymn on the piano. If God spoke into your heart today, and as a mom or a dad, you say, I've got to spend some more time investing in my kids. I, I'm convicted about an area in my life. Maybe I work too much. Maybe there's an area, I'm not teaching my kids the Bible. We're not together reading God's word as a family. Whatever it might be, if God has spoken to your heart this morning, would you take some time and respond to God's conviction in your life and ask him to give you the strength and the help that you need to be a better parent, a better grandparent, a better influencer of the children that you come across. Father, this morning we realize that we only have one life and it's soon going to be over. And the impact that we make on our children now is the only thing that we'll have 100 years from now. I pray that we would be able to raise our children in the way that they should go and influence those that come in contact with us, that we would be diligent in teaching them the word of God. And Lord, that we would hide your word in our hearts as well to be a good example um, to our children. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you that you are a great father who loves us unconditionally. And I ask you, Lord, that we'd be the example that you are to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, thank you for being here. Um, I know that there